You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a chronological historical true crime podcast. Each week we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. And at next, I just put, bruh, I hope y'all are traveling this week or have plenty of time set aside <laughs> because um, y'all got a, y'all got some doozies of episodes this week. I can tell you that. Um, doozies. Yeah. So I hope that y'all are ready for it. Speaking of, this is the week of Christmas. So I'm sure a lot of you are traveling at this moment. Merry Christmas. Um, or you're planning on it or you're wrapping presents or not sure what you're doing, but you're doing something. Or you're hiding in a closet from your family. And you just need some alone time. You know, that's always fun. It's always fun hiding, hiding away when you need to, I guess. <laughs> or just hiding somewhere. Yeah, hiding at all. Maybe in a bathroom. I don't know. Um, closet, basement. Your know. car. Uh, that too. I would I would gladly do that. Um, so I hope y'all enjoy your Christmas festivities that are coming up. Y'all still have a few days to get the last of your shopping in, wrapping up those presents, getting them under the tree. Last Guess how many presents I have wrapped? None. Zero. Look at you. At least I have more presents. Uh, I'm not done shopping, but I have I have a majority of presents. We have um, all but one present done. Mm-mm. And that's Michael's responsibility that yeah. the one present is. I, um, no, not done yet. We went, me and my boyfriend went shopping yesterday for a few things. So that was good. We did get a little bit of that done, but I still have some to do. So use this as some encouragement to <laughs> go ahead and get those gifts wrapped. Um, you could be like my boyfriend who, God love him, um, goes <laughs> to the dollar store and buys bags. And everyone gets a bag for Christmas. You don't get it wrapped. It goes in a bag. Um, no tissue paper, just a bag. <gasps> um, um, he, I, he, I, I have no excuse for him. Um, I told him earlier because he had to get back to his house. And I was like, hey, if you get there and you have like things you need wrapped, bring them back and I'll do it. <laughs> He's like, everybody has bags. And I was like, whatever. Okay. So use this as some encouragement to get those presents wrapped last minute notes to santa he's still taking requests as far as i know so i hope that y'all are ready for the holiday season at least if nothing else christmas falls at a weird time this year so Mm -hmm. it's it's a uh we got christmas eve on a friday and christmas on a saturday which is kind of odd um it's always weird especially when you work because Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like Christmas somehow. Right. It's right. very weird. Um so hope that y'all are uh when you work a regular nine to five. Right, nine to five. Yeah. Regular like when you have weekends off, it's it's always very weird when a holiday then falls on a weekend because mm-hmm. it kind of messes up, you know, your schedule and everything. But hope that y'all would like some murder on the side of wrapping. <laughs> um I mean, let's be honest here. But we got an interesting case this week, and we're going to go ahead and get into it. Our sources this week are Smithsonian Magazine, the New England Historical Society, the Historical Crime Detective. I feel like that's what I should make my my actual nom de plume, the <laughs> Historical Crime Detective. That would be good. It would be good. Uh, I feel like that's me. Um, but, but I think it's already taken. It now. seems as though it's already taken. I could do historicalcrimedetective.org.edu. Dot. Or detectress. Detective. (laughs) And then Hmm. we have the ever formidable murder by gaslight. Oh, investigator instead of detective. Historical crime investigator. That, that, that could work. I got you, baby. I found a sweatshirt the other day. Um, I, first of all, I have a couple of sweatshirts that I want. Um, (laughs) I'm a green. (laughs) <laughs> One of them is green. Yes. Um, I am a, I, for those who don't know, um, olive green is like, I, I don't know why I gravitate towards that color. But um, I found sweatshirts that I want. They're on Etsy. Um, one of them is green. And it cracks me up every time I see it. Oh, because dear. It says future ghost and it has a little ghost in between it. And it's just <laughs> so funny to me. And uh, so it's like on where the pocket of a shirt would be. It says future at the top, like over the top. And then the bottom says ghost. And in the center, there's like a little ghost. Um, that is pretty funny. So it's pretty funny. And then 
then I found a sweatshirt that just said unsub on it. And for those who are Criminal Minds fans, uh, y'all understand. Um, but they always call like the person that they're looking for. They call them the un- like the unsub. So hope that everybody is ready for our case this week. It's an interesting one. Full of um, trickery and deceit. You know, holiday season. Um, trickery, deceit, murder. Um, uh, wrong holiday. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, maybe that's just my holiday. I'll create a holiday. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Halloween <laughs> trickery. I don't know. No. Um. So, anyways, our events in 1830 for this week on January 7th, the first U.S. railroad station opened in Baltimore, Maryland. January 11th, LaGrange College opened and was the first publicly chartered college in Alabama. Oh. Do you know what university it is today? Tell me what it was called again. LaGrange College. LaGrange College. No, tell me. The University of North Alabama. <gasps> UNA. Very good college. Which my nephew is really looking into to UNA go to is a next good one. year because mm-hmm. isn't UNA that's where a lot of people go that end up working at NASA? Oh, I isn't that, that because isn't mm. isn't UNA Huntsville? It is. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah, I think that might be UNA or I think that's it because it's whatever is near Huntsville. So for those who don't know, um, the Huntsville area in Alabama, it's North Alabama, kind of right below the Tennessee line, and it's very well known. That's where. Um, the space, space Museum is. And space and Rocket Center. It's so cool. And there's like a NASA way station there. There's also like. Uh, one of our relatives worked there and worked on one of the. Um, one of the rockets. Mm-hmm. There, it's so cool mm-hmm. to go. And uh, we actually went earlier this year. Me and my boyfriend took his son uh, to the rocket center. And it was really, really cool. Um you can see inside a bunch of spaceships and all kinds of fun stuff. They also, that's where they have space camp where kids can go and you have space yes. camp and it's so cool. But they, uh, Redstone Arsenal is also up mm-hmm. there. That's uh, There's like, I want to say there's an FBI hub there. It's like a yeah. big, my boyfriend does a lot of work in Huntsville and um, he had to go out of town recently. And, and so he was staying up there and he said, he was like, yeah, I was sitting there at dinner and you know, because he was by himself. He's like, I'm listening in to people's conversations around me, <laughs> you know, as you do. And he said, and I was sitting by two people who were legitimately rocket scientists. Yeah. And it's just so funny because it's Alabama. Um, but it's very, very well known yeah. in Huntsville. There are and rocket so scientists in Alabama. January 11th of 1830, LaGrange College was founded. Very cool. Still here today. And they have a lion that is their mascot that lives there yes, that's on do. the campus. Yes, they do. Uh, let's see. January 13th, the Great Fire in New Orleans occurred. Uh, March 16th, the New York Stock Exchange experienced its slowest day ever reported. Guess how many trades were done that day? Think of how many trades are done on the stock exchange probably daily. This was the slowest day ever reported from the New York Stock Exchange. A hundred. Thirty-one. Ooh. <laughs> so, very, very little number. Uh, March 26th, the Book of Mormon was published in Palmyra. I think that's it. Or Palmyra, New York. April 6th, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was officially organized in Fayette, New York. May 20th. The first railroad timetable was published in the newspaper Baltimore American. That was interesting. May 24th, the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, written by Sarah Josephina Hale, was published in Boston. May 28th, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. Mm. A law that led to the forced removal of the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminole tribes out of Georgia and surrounding states, which started the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Uncool. Good old, good old U.S. Um, then July 15th, the Sioux, Soak, and Fox tribes signed the fourth treaty to Prairie du Chien, which gave the U.S. most of Minnesota, Iowa, and Missouri. 
also removing them mostly from their land as well. Because why not? Um, August 4th, the official plans for the city of Chicago were laid out. August 28th, the first American-built locomotive, Tom Thumb, raced (laughs) a horse-drawn car from Stockton and Stokes Stage Company from Baltimore to Ellicott Mills. Due to mechanical problems, the horse won. (laughs) Oh, no. So, September 9th, Charles Durant, who was the first U.S. aeronaut, flew a balloon from Castle Garden, New York City, to Perth Amboy, New Jersey. That's cool. September 25th, the first National Black Convention began in Philadelphia. And then September 20th, the first convention of free men agreed to boycott slave-produced goods. Hmm. It was interesting to me. Yes. Pretty cool. September 27th of that year, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek with the Choctaw Nation was signed. And it was the first treaty signed after the Indian Removal Act. Hmm. Our births in 1830 on May 9th. We don't really have too many for this year, actually. Um... We're kind of just kind of let people know kind of what time period, timetable we're in. We're approaching Civil War times um, Mm -hmm. at this point in our history. So a lot of the births that are coming up like right now are all like Civil War generals. And And so people that that will recognize later, but not like there's so many names that unless it's a really well known person um not talking about him honestly so because eventually we'll get to the civil war and that'll be fine and we'll discuss the civil war then but uh may 9th harriet lane was born she was the acting first lady of the u.s during james buchanan's presidency she was his niece and he was the only president who never married Never. Hmm. So we did have a single president. Yeah. Because we had talked about before that we didn't think that we had one. He never married, Mm -hmm. Um, which was very interesting. So she was the acting first lady. December 10th, we know someone born on that day. And then we know someone on the 11th. Mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson was born. She's an American poet and a Sagittarius. Oh, Harriet Lane was a Taurus for anybody wondering. Um, Emily Dickinson is a Sagittarius. Good old Sagittarius's. They're known to be a little bit hard-headed. Um, I can say that because I I, uh, I have one. I have one. Hmm. I raise one. <laughs> I grew up She's hard-headed. One. Our deaths in 1830. June 25th, we have Ephraim McDowell, an American physician and pioneer surgeon. He was the first person to successfully remove an ovarian tumor. And he is called the father of ovariotomy and the founding father of abdominal surgery. Cool. And can I tell you, I really like the name Ephraim. Ephraim is a, it's a cool name. I really like it. Ephraim. August 9th, James Armstead Lafayette. He was an enslaved man who served uh, the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War under... Marquis de Lafayette. I was going to say, I know that name. Lafayette. Someday the source by the reason. Um, anyways, he served. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. James served as a double agent and was responsible for reporting the activities of Benedict Arnold. Oh, we know about him. We know about him, too. He fed the British false information while giving the Americans accurate information accounts of British movements. So September 23rd, Elizabeth Monroe, fifth U.S. President James Monroe's wife, um, she passed away. Elizabeth was not in good health during her husband's presidency, and her mm-hmm. oldest daughter, Eliza Monroe Hay, actually took over official White House hostess duties. Mm-hmm. So he had a first lady, but she was not well enough to do first lady duties. So. On to our case, April 6th of 1830 in Salem, Massachusetts. John Francis Knapp and Joseph Jenkins Knapp had Richard Crown and Shield murder Captain Joseph White in an attempt to obtain inheritances. Wow. And next, I just put, finally, we are in Salem, Massachusetts this week. And I apologize in advance. 
because we're in Salem, and I don't know when we're coming back. Yeah, I was so going to say, I know you've been are. waiting for this. Salem is a historic coast city located in the North Shore region in Essex County, mm-hmm. yeah, Essex County, Massachusetts. The peninsula that would eventually be called Salem was originally known as the Namkeag by the native tribes in the area. This was a major settlement for the indigenous group that controlled territory from the Mer- territory from the Merrimack to the Mystic Rivers. Colonists officially settled in the area in 1626, just a couple years back, just a bit. When fishermen arrived from Cape Ann, led by Roger Conant, we'll say that that's it. <laughs> Conant's leadership provided the stability to survive the first two years, but he was replaced by order of the Massachusetts Bay Company. The settlement changed its name from Nom Kiag to Salem. Easier to pronounce. Very much so, which is an American speaking version of Shalom. Shalom refers to the royal city of, oh, I did not put how to say this. Melkin. Oh, yeah, I know. Never mind. Melkinzedek. <laughs> not, how, not how it said. Um, and it is traditionally identified as Jerusalem. So later in 1628, the, quote, great house in Cape Ann was disassembled and moved to Salem to be the governor's house. This was the first house built of its kind in New England. One author describes it as, quote, of the model in England first called Tudor and afterwards the Elizabethan, which is essentially Gothic. So it was the first Gothic home in New England. And I do love that style. I oh, love it. So, so pretty. Mm-hmm. It Very was, grand. Right. And this is the reason why in this area <clears throat> it was such a big deal is because it was two stories with a sharp pitched roof and at this time two story houses were not yeah a major th- they were coming into existence because keep in mind this was 1628 yeah and so there was the time period we're in now of 1831 yes there are plenty of houses that were were brick stone sure. structures because there are a lot of houses that are um row houses that were built right. in the same time period. But this was one of the first houses that was two stories and also in that Gothic style. Well, I mean, just the resources and the people, mm-hmm. and you know, they're they're just starting the settlement over here right. then. And so, I mean, they're starting literally from scratch. Exactly. So, yeah, that's a big deal. It, yeah, it's so that's why it was actually disassembled and then moved. Right. We talked about moving houses in another episode. Yeah, that's a totally um, different way of moving Totally house. different. <laughs> that, that one you actually take it apart john winthrop i can't speak john winthrop was elected governor in 1629 and his arrival in the colonies began the puritan great migration samuel skelton was the first pastor of the first church of salem which was the original puritan church in america during this time was the highly controversial trial of Dorothy Talby. Um, so a bit of a trigger here for just a second. It's extremely important to discuss these things because, um, one, it is part of the history. Two, this is something that was influential later on. Um, when it comes to sentencing laws uh, and things of that nature, but a big of a bit of a trigger warning because it does involve a child. So, right off the bat, right, uh, just jumping right into it for the holiday season. Merry <laughs> Christmas! Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, this was a time when mental health was not taken into consideration when a crime was committed. Dorothy was labeled as a, quote, insane woman and was hanged for killing her three-year-old daughter because she claimed God told her to do it. Governor John Winthrop said that Dorothy was possessed by Satan, but at the time when the colonies only governed based off of biblical principles, the penalty for murder, regardless of the reason, was death. In 1637, the foundation for the Army National Guard was actually laid into effect and the first time a regiment of militia drilled for the common defense of a multi-community area. Essentially, the National Guard was created. So, 
there was that. But yeah, the story of Dorothy is, um, there's a lot that it goes into. But after her case, um, it was actually mental health started to come in as a factor in punishment for crimes. Mm, sounds like possible schizophrenia. I want to say, yeah, I want to say, yeah, probably schizophrenia. Um, there's a lot of different things that it could be because, oh, sure. it, I mean, it, her daughter is young. So there's really, or was young. There's really no telling kind of what that mm-hmm. could have been. I would veer on the side of schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're not professionals. But right. No, not Modern day, it sounds, it does sound It does sound, like that. yeah. Saying that the voice has told you to do it is, it, it does sound along those lines. Mm-hmm. So uh, later in 1641, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties was written as a first step to try and develop a body of law for the colony. This might not have helped Dorothy in her situation, but it was a step in the right direction. It stated, and this is a direct quote, before anyone says anything, <laughs> it stated, quote, children idiots, distracted persons, and all that are strangers or newcomers to our plantation shall have such allowances and dispensations in any cause, whether criminal or other, as religion and reason required. And let's just be clear. Right. Verbiage and um, terminology changes Has throughout changes. the years. Yes. Uh, I mean, year to year it changes. Yes. But, well, yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, my mother was a special ed teacher mm-hmm. and from her, she had a very, she retired a special ed teacher. So, I mean, she had many, many years and um, I don't want to say labels because label is not the right word. Um, uh, what Descriptors? The, not even that. Um Diagnosis. Diagnosis. That's the word. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> um, you know, a diagnosis, it, it would change. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, oh, well, we're not calling it that because, you know, right. that's been deemed as not okay. Because when she started, um, the the word, well, the term mentally retarded mm-hmm. was, was actually used. Right. Now, it was in, commonplace and it was, yes. uh, I mean, by but, doctor standards, right. and, they and, would and, say that. And I will say, MR is mentally retarded, and and it means slower in Mm -hmm. the mind. And that really is what it is. Now, in front of my mother, and really in front of me, because really it's not okay, you know, you don't call somebody retarded. Right. That's that's not not okay. That is not okay. And I mean, I'm sorry I even said that out loud, because that's, that's just not okay to say. But just like... Back then, that was the terminology mm-hmm. that was used. Right. Um, and MR is still, if I'm not mistaken, I've not been in education for a while. I do believe that it is still um, a diagnosis, but, you know, it's not just a oh, That well, terminology and vocabulary has expanded vastly. Exactly. Since then. But it's not just, you wouldn't say, oh, well, that child is retarded. Right. It would be, no. You know, they are MR or mentally, mentally handicapped. Ch- or mentally challenged. Mentally challenged or mentally mm-hmm. handicapped is generally what you would see more. Um, so just usually saying, now it's generally. Um, Instead of that, what people normally go off of now is the actual diagnosis well, sure. rather than a generalization. But so that's like, what the correct. diagnosis would be. But well, now we've gotten even more pinpoint. Right. Because you have like ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder. You have, right. you know, a lot. So a lot of but times. But that's a different thing. Correct. But a lot of times when people speak of mental um, you know, challenges that people may have. I think now a lot of times people will use the specific diagnosis rather than the generalized yeah. terms. I guess that's might be where the changes come in. Where we live, we actually have a um, a school that is specifically right, built right. for um well and that is for, for the children. more that and that is for more right. severe. I know it's what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very good school it, yeah. it's it's very it's, helpful to a lot of people which is that cannot otherwise afford like private right. privatized and it education. is for more severely impacted students Correct. who cannot re- really cannot 
be in they a need to be classroom. in a specific environment to thrive right, right. right. and so you know i yeah it's, anyway just to say yeah we would never call someone an correct, idiot no but not in that i mean I'm going, well not in that term but not no. not correct to, no yeah correct not it not in speaking of someone who has mental um challenges uh, yes so, not at all but the but, terminology then yes that's, that's what it was. definitely the terminology so but yes um it would not have helped dorothy at that time but basically they it's were just at least showing that they realized yeah they were saying that they realized that maybe going off of biblical principles was not the way to approach certain issues that it needed a little bit more consideration instead of a black and white answer. I think that was more of what it was moving into because like they said, based on their laws, you know, you kill someone, you die. That's, that was like, if this, then this taking a more individual approach to different cases. So after this point, we are going to get into arguably one of the most infamous events in Salem history. Dun, dun, the that Salem. Was that, was, that was a good one. The Thanks. Salem witch trials started in 1692, and 14 women and five men were executed by hanging because of false accusations. She's a witch! Giles Corey was pressed to death because he would not submit a plea. Oh, my. Um, That is an interesting story. Um, Yes. So he was accused of being a witch. Um, Would they not have called him a warlock? They called him a witch at this time. So, which was, which was BS. It was weird. Um, But they accused him and I believe they had already accused his wife and she had already been hanged. Um, but they wanted him to confess as well, and he would not confess. For those who do not know what pressing is, um, I will say this. It Does is not when sound lovely. It's not at all. It's actually terrifying, uh, honestly, for someone who has a bit of claustrophobia. Um, it is essentially when they place like a large wooden plank on top of someone's body and then add stones. Mm progressively until you are physically pressed into the ground uh, so you can't breathe um but he died an innocent man and with his dying breath he cursed the town oh and that curse has proven true since the Salem witch trials. Oh my. Which is very scary, but he cur- because the person who was trying to do it was the sheriff of the town was trying to get him to confess. And so he uh cursed the sheriff of the town and basically said like I don't remember the exact words, but he said, you know, I hope that you die of, you know, basically like heart ailment or blood poisoning or something like that. Well, that sheriff did die of a heart attack. And, like, every sheriff since then has had major heart issues or (gasps) has died while being the sheriff. Oh, my. It is crazy. I want to say only in the past few years something occurred to where it didn't happen. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I do know that they talk about it on the podcast Morbid. They go into it as to what happened because they actually live really close to Salem. And so they go there um, and see it a good bit. But yeah, so, so who runs for sheriff? Right. I mean. So um, I want it. Mm, I want to say, and I might not be right, but I want to say they got a female sheriff. Did you just growl? Yeah, I did. Okay. I want to say they got like a female sheriff or something, and that's what broke the loop. Huh. Because it was maybe, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, Don't email me. So <laughs> <laughs> I may be speaking out of turn. Yeah. Anyway, so Giles Corey was one who died an innocent man. There is a, uh, I want to say there's a placard of him that's in town. Um, And at least five other people died while waiting in prison. 
God. Judge John Hawthorne was the presiding judge over most of the witchcraft trials in Salem. He sentenced so many people to death due to accusations of being a witch that he became known as the Hanging Judge. Awesome. Great. What a thing to be known as. <sighs> Better than peg leg, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll take peg leg. I'll, I'll take that. Um, I'd rather be Judge peg leg than the hanging judge. And I did think of a very Oof. good case for why I, I would want the peg Oof. leg while Oof. I was in the shower. Shower thoughts. Continue. <laughs> Salem was a major port for smaller ships to transport goods and had a large part in trading for the colonies. The Great Salem Fire of 1914 destroyed over 400 homes and left 3,500 families homeless. Wow. Thankfully, the historic district on Chestnut Street remained untouched. Salem has also been host to movies and shows alike over the years. Episode 205, which is funny because that is the area code for where we live, of Bewitched was filmed there in June of 1970. I love that show. Oh, my gosh. The ever Disney classic Hocus Pocus filmed most of the daytime scenes in the movie there in Salem. Sisters? Uh, such a good... And also, sorry guys, tangent E, we I get it. Just stay with us on this ride here. You're here already. Um might as well just stick around and see where this goes. Because it's usually fun. Usually. Um Hocus Pocus, very problematic watching it as an adult. Why? It's a lot of talk of like virgin lighting candles <laughs> and Sarah being overly obsessed with boys and she's clearly over the well she's a witch so she's like over a hundred at this point <laughs> but it's very as I was watching it so I introduced my daughter to Hocus Pocus last year and so we watched it a lot this year during the during Halloween and uh, my child is much like me and that she will watch Halloween movies any time of the year because well, yeah it's always Halloween um and as I'm watching it one time, I'm sitting there watching it with her and I'm like, this is prob like, this is <laughs> okay. Um, well, maybe there are some, I mean, there's, there's a few things that, that, that are said in the movie that uh -huh. I go, oh, oh, like with the bus driver, we require children. I know. It might take me a couple of tries. I know. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm like, oh, wait a, oh, wait a, wait a, wait a all right. minute. Um, it's very weird. So, but I mean, a muck, a muck, a muck, a I mean, I mean that just, ugh. just such a good one. So, anyways, most of the daytime scenes were filmed in the area. The house um, is in that Beautiful area, house. so uh, it's very cool. Sabrina, the teenage witch, filmed an episode in Salem, and I did like that show too. Her cat slash familiar was named Salem, and do you know that that same cat? It was actually uh, when they had to use a like an animatronic that was the same cat as Binks that they used. Did you know that? Salem and Binks were the, that I was the same one. I say I did, but now you know for sure. Yes. Because, um, I mean, they're the same exact cat if you look I at mean, them. So I am full of useless facts. I, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was such a good show. I really enjoyed um, it. I loved the ants. Did you see the spoof? Like the somebody was really cruel around Halloween time. They were like, "Oh, oh they're yeah, so a they were bringing it back." And I got kind of excited because, yeah. like, it was her on it. I was like, "Oh, that's awesome!" And then Melissa like, Joan Hart was like, "I don't know who said this, but this isn't true. But I would do it." Like, yeah, like <laughs> she came out and said, it. "Like, I'll do it." Um, so kind of made me sad. Anyways, also for those who don't know what a familiar is, a uh, familiar in witchy terms is essentially like someone's, it's a witch's uh, companion in a way. Critter. Um, that anyways, that's more, it's not just a pet. It's a little bit different. So just in well, case anybody yes. is wondering what that is, uh, that's what the term was called. And when they talk about Salem in Sabrina, the teenage witch, if you like look at anything about Salem, They'll refer to Salem as her familiar more than her cat. So mm -hmm. in case you ever see that, that's what that means. Uh, the 2012 Rob Zombie film, The Lords of Salem, uh, had some scenes filmed there. Scenes from the 2013 film, American Hustle. Scenes for the 2008 film, 
Bride Wars, always a classic. Love that and movie. The television series Motherland Fort Salem was based in Salem in an alternate history timeline. Mm. I never knew about this show, Mm-mm. and I'm very curious because they said that it was an alternate historical timeline as if certain Salem events never happened. That's intriguing. So very interesting. I, I think that they are. Um, so let's see. Salem State University is located in the city and is the largest of the nine schools comprising the state university system in Massachusetts. This I just love. I feel a kinship with Salem, if y'all cannot tell. (laughs) And these things just sealed it even more for me. Salem High School's mascot is a witch and their newspaper is called Witch's Brew. (laughs) I am obsessed. There is also an elementary school in the area named Witchcraft Heights. I mean, come on. It's amazing. Uh, Samuel McIntyre was one of the first architects in the United States, and his work is a prime example of early federal style architecture. The Samuel McIntyre Historic District is one of the largest concentrations of 17th and 18th century domestic structures in America. It includes McIntyre commissions such as the Pierce Nichols House and Hamilton Hall. Hamilton Hall is located on Chestnut Street where many grand mansions can be traced back to roots of old China trade. Hamilton Hall was built in 1805 by Samuel McIntyre and is considered one of his best pieces. It was declared a historic landmark by the National Park Service in 1970. His house and workshop were located at 31 Summer Street in what is now the Samuel McIntyre Historic District. One of the most popular houses in Salem is the Witch House. The only structure in Salem with direct ties to the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. The Witch House is owned and operated by the City of Salem as a historic house museum. The Pickman House was built circa 1664, um, and it has the Witch Memorial and Burying Point Cemetery, which is the second oldest burying ground in the United States. Interesting. So what is the oldest? I don't know. Okay. Uh, The Gedney House is a historic house museum built circa 1665 and is the second oldest house in Salem. Then you have... The House of Seven Gables, which a lot of people will know. It's a 1668 colonial mansion named for its gables. It was made famous by Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1851 novel, The House of Seven Gables. I was going to say that. It kind of sounds familiar. Um, It's a very popular tourist location. Hawthorne described it in his book as, quote, The aspect of the venerable mansion has always affected me like a human countenance. It was itself like a great human heart with a life of its own and full of rich and somber remnants. The deep projection of the section story gave the house a meditative look that you could not pass it without the idea that it had a secret to keep. So question. Yes. Is he a descendant of the hanging judge? No. Hawthorne and Hawthorne. Okay. Are well, two I didn't dudes. see yes. how they were. Yeah, um, they're said similarly, mm-hmm. but uh the judge was Hawthorne H A and uh, some people say Hawthorne, but it doesn't sound right to me. Um so Hawthorne is in Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer is H A W okay. and the other is just H A. Okay. So well, I didn't see the spelling. So. There was another judge at the time that was not the judge that was referred to as the mm-hmm. hanging judge that I believe Nathaniel Hawthorne is a descendant okay. of, but not the same one. All right. So that would have been kind of interesting, mm-hmm. kind of another claim to fame other than being a famous author. Correct. Okay. Notable people from Salem. This is just. It's Salem. That's all I'm going to say. Um, notable people from Salem include Laurie Cabot. She is the founder of the Wiccan Cabot tradition of the science of witchcraft and the Witches League for Public Awareness. The for- Witches League for Public Awareness is a club, kind of, that advocates for the rights of others. This is very interesting. Elias Haskett Derby is coined as America's first millionaire. And he was from Salem. 
Joseph Dixon, founder of the Dixon Ticonderoga Company. And if you have a child of pencil buying age, then you know what the Ticonderoga Company is because they make pre-sharpened pencils. The best pencils. If you are a teacher, mm-hmm. you know they are the best pencils and they're the ones that you want your children. It's your... required at my daughter's school. It says it has to be yeah. Ticonderoga Look, because pencils. those little cutesy pencils that you can get, they oh, are yeah, pieces of junk mm-hmm. because the lead is broken on the inside of mm-hmm. them. You sharpen them, the lead just falls out. Ugh, it's a whole thing. Headaches. Well, and then they have like the wrap on the mm-hmm. outside of them and it just gums up your pencil sharpener, mm-hmm. messes them up. Look, former teacher right here. Yeah, her school requires Jump. you to have those. Those so are the best. I buy them. Uh, Nathan- Thank you. You're welcome. And Nathaniel Hawthorne, as I said before, he's the author of The House of Seven Gables and The Scarlet Letter. Yep, yep, yep. And George Swinnerton Parker. Bless his heart. What a name. I do not bless his heart whatsoever because Uh this man is rich beyond (laughs) our wildest imaginations. Because if you know the last name Parker in any sense, then you would know he is the co-founder of Parker Brothers that produced Monopoly, Clue. I I like Clue. And the Ouija board. Mm. Parker Brothers actually sells that, which I find very funny and interesting. So I do not like Monopoly. Monopoly is not great. And they've got so many different versions of Monopoly now. Like there's Mm -hmm. one that's specifically called like Monopoly's Cheater Edition. And (laughs) you have it's it. The rules are insane. Um, I looked at getting it one time and it it was just too much for me. I mean, once upon a time, I did like McDonald's Monopoly because I. You know, that was as always a college fun. student, I liked getting free food. Well, and any people who listen to True Crime Obsessed might, you know, have their little ears perked up hearing about that because there is a documentary on the McDonald's Monopoly scandal Ooh. because the people who were winning the big prizes were related to people that worked for the company that did the McDonald's Monopoly program. How shocking. And they started figuring it out. Anyways, it's a crazy documentary, and it's actually kind of fun because they go through and they find, and some of them don't didn't know that they were, like, intentionally given this winning Monopoly oh. thing. It was like this relative gave it to them, and they want. It's very interesting. So that's why... That type of McDonald's Monopoly is not done anymore. Interesting. So, because McDonald's Monopoly was a lot of fun. It was interesting. Look, I just um, like getting free food when I was in college. I mean, you know. Yeah, y'all didn't have a Taco Bell down there then at that point. Y'all just had McDonald's. Yeah, I but I had one in in my hometown. Yeah. But I didn't. Not in college. Yeah, but I wouldn't really. Uh, Taco Bell's food. amazing. Um, of course, I, there's some on your counter now that sure. I brought with me. Sure, sure. You know. So, finally, on to our case for this week, the murder of Captain Joseph White. Captain White was a wealthy retired merchant living in Salem, Massachusetts. Captain White's house stood at 128 Essex Street and was noted as one of the grandest houses in the town. It was built in 1804 with three floors a red brick facade, and a porch with white Corinthian columns. And it had a beautiful wood-carved balcony on the home. Wow. You can look up photos of this house. It is gorgeous. It sounds like like it. It is so pretty. And especially for the time that it was built, it's, like, kind of amazing that it's so, like, it looks the way that it does. Because 1804. So, anywho. By the time of our story, Captain White is 82. So, a couple years. Pretty, pretty, pretty long life. A little bit experienced in life. Right. I couldn't find anything on his early life, but what we do know is that he either had never married, according to the historical crime detective, or he was a widower, according to Smithsonian Magazine. A little bit of a contradiction there. A little bit. He had a maid servant named Lydia Kimball and a handyman named Benjamin White. No relation. He employed his niece, Mary Beckford, as his housekeeper, who was described as, quote, a fine-looking woman of 40 or 45. 
her daughter, who was also named Mary. Can we just normalize naming our kids after us as women? I just want to say that. Um, I always think that it's so funny when I see that now. Um, So she had a daughter named Mary who worked for Captain White until she married a man named Joseph Knapp Jr., The couple moved to Wenham, which is around seven miles away from Salem. The Knapps were a highly respected family consisting of the father, Joseph Knapp Sr., and his two sons, Joseph Knapp Jr. and John Francis Knapp. On April 5th of 1830, Mom Mary went to visit her daughter in Wenham, leaving Captain White alone for the weekend. On the morning of April 7th at 6 a.m., Captain White's handyman walked into the kitchen and opened the shutters. He noticed that the back window of the parlor was open and that a wood plank was leaning against it. He quickly informed the maid and the two started to check around the house to see if anything else was amiss. Once they reached Captain White's room, they noticed the door was opened and this was a bit of a surprise since typically the door would be shut unless Captain White was up for the day and neither of them heard him stirring in his room. This is foreshadowing. It is. It is. So they slowly pushed open the door and were in shock as they took in the scene before them. The bed was turned down as if Captain White had not laid in the bed that night, but then they looked over and saw Captain White dressed in his night clothes. He was covered in blood, stiff and dead, lying diagonally across the bed. They touched nothing else in the room. They took they took a note from our other guys in our other story. Yep, they were smart. They touched nothing else in the room and immediately went to the authorities. His body was examined and it was revealed that he had a blow to the head that fractured his skull, but it did not break the skin. Which is interesting. Hmm. Then there were also 13 deep wounds found on the body. Oh. Curiously. Deep wounds meaning like puncture wounds? Um, it didn't go into it. I think um I think more of like a cutting wound, kind of like a deep, a deep cut. Okay. Um we'll talk more about it. So I was just curious. Yeah, it's it yeah. For the, I don't know why I was curious. Well, was curious. what I was curious about is that he had a blow to the head that fractured his skull, but it didn't break his skin. Yeah, that is interesting. Which is weird. So that made me think that it was like, like it. Sorry, guys, but this is what it makes me think of is like if somebody hit someone across the head with like, um, those spindles on uh staircases you know how like the staircases Mm -hmm. will have spin and they're like thick like the thick wooden ones Mm -hmm. like something like that that it is heavy enough but with it being on your head you would think a head still at 82 i mean at 82 your your skin is kind of thin yeah it's yeah so your collagen is gone look at that look at me so paying attention to those skincare commercials (laughs) (laughs) so it was very interesting but they just said that he had 13 deep wounds Curiously, the house hadn't been robbed and everything of value still remained in the room. Both Mm -hmm. the maid and the handyman knew that Captain White kept an iron chest in his bedroom that contained gold doubloons and it was untouched as well, which is weird. Why would somebody come in the house and then not literally steal the chest of gold sitting in the corner? I mean, that doesn't make sense. I mean, weird. It wasn't an inconspicuous chest either. Um, It's not like you wouldn't notice it. Yeah, it it seemed as though um, it was like what you literally think of as a treasure chest. (laughs) Like like a big iron trunk. Right. As a chest. Like it it was very, so it didn't seem like it was something that you would just see and go, oh, okay. And just look thinking at something else. It screams pirate ship. Right. Like. And I don't know if this is a thing kind of everywhere, but in the South, a lot of people have hope chests um, that they'll put like, I don't know. Do you have hope chests Um, or does your mom? My mom is not from the South. Well, I didn't know. (laughs) Well, because for some people it's, it's like a, um, I have a, a, I have a cedar chest. So Yeah, yeah, it's like an older generation kind of thing. And your hope chest is kind of a lot of times it, it's almost like a large Almost looks like a bench that you would put at the bottom of yeah. your bed. Yeah, and and actually, mom and dad do have a, a cedar yeah. chest, and and I have one. Michael got and me it's, one. It's kind of what you put like the important things, like 
heirlooms, kind of like people would put stuff in a hope chest. So. Well, and and re- um, it was more like used for, um, like I think of Anna Green Gables for some reason and a uh, little house on the prairie. But like that's what you put your um, trousseau in. You know, your mm-hmm. your when you're preparing for getting married you mm-hmm. put in your your linens that you've prepared and yeah your, it's like your uh, it's like your important things to you yeah kind yes of. yes your 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 treasure right. chest i mean basically it's, your your good linens your right. um, that's where you would keep so, your baptismal dress for that you would hand down and that right. sort of thing so it's kind of like I guess like an inheritance chest is a good way to put heirlooms. it like yeah it's like heirlooms it's things that you want like if you if your house were on fire, you would grab that. Right, it's kind of one of your those wedding things. album. Right. Your if well, right. not in that time, but but right, but you know those important things. So and like Leah said, most of the time these are like cedar chests, like they're substantial, but, cedar but they're keeps cedar. Moths out. Right. Well, this was an iron chest mm-hmm. sitting in the corner, you know, not to be overlooked. Right. Like <laughs> very odd. Um. So it seemed it was accidentally overlooked by the murderer. However, the more the scene was searched, it became apparent by almost everyone that the intent of this crime was only to murder Captain White. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to, like, do this, do it right. Make it look... Not saying you need to kill people because, as I've said, what if I said it once, I've said it a billion times. I mean, but they say all the time, like, if you watch crime shows like on ID Network, Mm -hmm. uh, which is Investigation Discovery or Oxygen or anything, and they'll talk about, like, people who do murder their spouses and then they try to make it look like a robbery. Um, The Menendez brothers did that, and we'll get to them eventually. That is a, that's a bear of a case because I... I've studied more into the Menendez brothers, and I will not say that I feel sorry for them for killing their parents. No. I feel sorry for their childhood and themselves. They went through a lot. Um, doesn't justify murder. No. But it's it's crazy. But when that happened at the Menendez house, they tried to make it look like a robbery. Mm-hmm. But what they didn't do was take anything of value. They just kind of threw things around. Right. And then the police were like, why are things thrown around, but nothing's taken? Right. So then they kind of knew like, okay, this was staged. Like, right, and, right. and a lot of times when there is kind of like a snapped episode or anything like that, um, and they try to cover it up by making it look like the house was robbed, that's what they always miss is like taking the valuables right. with them instead of just opening drawers. Don't just pretend. Um, I mean, if you're, this is not a guide to murder, but, um, you know, just, yeah, that's kind of why I stopped. Just I was like, interesting. Mm, let's, let's not give tips. I people. mean, you know, and enough of people who listen to this probably do watch ID network and stuff. So I'm, I'm sure we have enough, uh, budding true crime enthusiasts listening that already know these things. So, There is that. Um, So the murder came as a shock to everyone in the town, and the same sentiments were echoed amongst the citizens. Captain White didn't have any enemies, and he was only spoken of in the highest regards. So who would have done this, and why would they have done this? Of course, the first place most people looked were at the maid and the handyman. The window that the murderer came through was unlocked, and that was very unusual. Some people thought that it could have been an inside conspiracy, and the employees of Captain White were in on it. But these rumors were quickly squelched because the two had been longtime trusted employees who were more like a part of the family than anything else. Also, nothing was stolen from the home, and if they were to have done something, the assumption would be that they did it for some kind of monetary gain. Yeah, and why would they have stuck around? Mm -hmm. There were footprints found in the garden outside the window as well, and they didn't match either of the employees' footprints. It couldn't have been his niece, Mary Buckford, either, because she was off in Wenham visiting her daughter, Mary, for the weekend. The town was distraught over the death of the beloved Captain White and terrified that something this heinous could happen in their town. Large rewards were offered for the capture and conviction of the assassin, whoever that may be. A committee of vigilance, which just sounds, it was called the Committee of Vigilance, which I just think is funny, um, which just makes me think of like vigilante justice. Anyways. Yes. 
It was formed and they were to launch a full-scale investigation into the murder. Almost all of the town shut down the day of Captain White's funeral. Aww. The Knapp brothers were questioned by the committee and said that the night before the murder, they were traveling from Salem to Wenham when they were attacked by three robbers. The were they ma- Irish? Oh, no. I'm sorry. The men <laughs> were in a horse-drawn, it was a horse-drawn chaise is mm. what it was called. Not what you would think. Um, it was like there was one horse on the front and then it was not quite a buggy, but kind of one. Mm -hmm. And there was a place on the back for you to put like large pieces of luggage, Uh but they called it a chaise. Okay. So that's what they were in. Um, one man grabbed the horse's bridle and the other two men grabbed a small trunk on the back of the chaise. According to the brothers, they held off the robbers and eventually the robbers magically left them alone and magically. disappeared into the night. It's a miracle. So if anybody's been on TikTok, you might have heard the audio of Cardi B where it's like, that's suspicious. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what it made me think of. The story threw the city into a tailspin and had everyone convinced that a gang of assassins were operating in their midst and they were responsible for the murder. Time continued to pass and the city grew more suspicious of those around them and it seemed the mystery would never be solved. That is, until someone who was being held in a jail in New Bedford, Massachusetts, 70 miles away, spoke up and claimed to have useful information. A member of the Committee of Vigilance traveled to the jail to gather a statement from the prisoner referred to as Hatch. Hatch had been arrested for shoplifting right before the murder, and even though he had been telling people that he knew of the murder plot, he was ignored. The member of the committee interrogated Hatch and stated that a few months before the murder, he was friends with Richard Crowninshield. Richard's reputation was less than desirable, And he had told Hatch on several occasions that he intended to kill Captain White. Hatch's statement proved helpful, and he was brought in front of a grand jury. His testimony secured an indictment against Richard Crowninshield. Now, I told y'all this is a bit of a long episode because there's a few things here that I don't think we've ever gotten into. Um, And so I think this is kind of a good place as any, to go through what those are. So first, what is an indictment? Okay. If someone is indicted, what does that actually mean? Simply put, this is just a formal charge or accusation of a serious crime. So it's basically saying we have enough to say that this person probably did this crime. So it's it's an actual formal charge of the crime. To we that really person. think you did it, and right. we say we have enough proof to make it stick. So what is a grand jury. A grand jury is very different from a trial jury, but they do have similar duties. The explanation of this can vary in different countries, and some might not even have the same process. But in the United States, a grand jury typically consists of 16 to 23 people. 12 votes are required to return an indictment. If the charges are thought to be unfounded, then the accusation is dismissed as unfounded. However, all grand jury proceedings are conducted behind closed doors without a presiding judge and only with the prosecution. Hmm. This is where things get tricky. Because neither the defense or the person accused and up for indictment are allowed to be present during grand jury proceedings unless they are invited and the chances are slim to none. Hmm. This means that the defense does not have the right to present evidence that the accused is innocent. So to break that down simply, the grand jury process I'll say this is my personal opinion. I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. It might be something that I'm passionate about, but here we go. 
To break it down simply, the grand jury process is prosecutor friendly because the grand jurors only see and hear what the prosecutor puts in front of them. While this is a right under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, the debate for quite a while has been if grand jury proceedings are a just part of the justice system. In fact, in 1985, and this might be a um, term that some people have heard, so now you'll know where it's from. In 1985, former Chief Judge of New York State, Sol Wachtler, interesting name. That is that is quite the name right there. <laughs> he spoke with the New York Daily News and the article stated, quote, in a bid to make prosecutors more accountable for their actions, Chief Judge Sol Wachtler has proposed that the state scrap the grand jury system of bringing criminal indictments. Wachtler, who became the judge, became the state's top judge earlier this month, said district attorneys now have so much influence on grand juries that, quote, by and large, they could get them to indict a ham sandwich. Interesting. And that was a judge that came forward and said that. So finally, the Washington Post reported that in a year time period where 193,000 993,000 cases were looked at, 162,350 were prosecuted. As for the over 30,000 that were not, only 11, 11 of 193,000, only 11 were because a grand jury did not return an indictment. Ooh. If that number wasn't shocking enough, here's another. That means that only 0.0006% of the cases pursued by prosecutors were not indicted because of a grand jury. So way less than even 1%. Mm. So now as you can see, this is something I'm a bit passionate about. Because you? Well, there's absolutely no way that 11 of the cases that went before the grand jury didn't have enough evidence. There's no way. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, there's not. I don't see that. Personally, I believe it would be more accurate because I know people are going to say, well, Kayla, if you don't have, like, if you don't think that that's what we should do, then what should we do? I'm glad you asked. Who asked? Dear listener. Um, <laughs> you did in your head. Claire asked. Um, <laughs> she's sitting here. She, she asked. She wanted okay. to know. So, personally... I believe that it would be much more accurate if you had a randomized pool of legal professionals to review all of the evidence and hear from the prosecution. If you still want it to be a prosecutory based system, most Americans are not at all familiar with the court system terminology or the actual law. True. So it would make more sense. And I'm not saying people who like, oh, we know these people, they're, you know, they're in the courthouse. I'm saying like a randomized group of legal professionals. Kind of like jury, jury selection, but for... Right, for just a grand jury mm -hmm. that has legal professionals that have no bearing on, I mean, just like when you would choose a jury, like do you have any connection to this case or, you know, so on and so forth. That way, at least people who have a legal knowledge if this is how we choose to continue this process, at least someone who knows the law is looking at this case, not someone who is going to be easily influenced by a prosecutor because all you're getting is the prosecutor's side. So anyways, interesting system. I'm not a lawyer and nothing I say is law advice. I just put steps off soapbox. Okay, thanks. Bye. Um, just your thoughts, just my thoughts. It's, it's just an aggravating system, especially when you look down at the numbers, it's mm. frustrating and, um, and you've thought about it. I have. And knowing the number of people who are unjustly, not only arrested, but the number of people who are unjustly prosecuted for a crime that they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's based off of, you know, not solely based off of a grand jury indictment, but like 
your main chance of it being dismissed is, you know, you it goes to a grand jury and then it's pushed through when you don't have the right to defend yourself. Yeah. That just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah. Like that doesn't, you're getting one side of a story. I can convince you all day long that last night, I had spaghetti and meatballs for dinner, which I did. It was amazing. But I can convince you all day long that that's exactly what it was. And that's 100% what it was. And I could say, you know, I could tell you that's exactly what we had. And you would go, okay, so that's what you did. That's what you had, right? You're telling me this. You're showing me. I show you. Here's the leftovers in the refrigerator. Right. But if I didn't have that last night, I actually had something else. And my boyfriend comes in and says, No, we didn't have that. We had stir fry last night. You would go, well, I've already seen the, I've already seen the evidence for the spaghetti. Like, clearly you had spaghetti. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just not, it doesn't seem like a good process to me. And it has been up for debate um, in many states as to whether the grand jury process should continue. There are a lot of countries who have outlawed it all together. Um, so it's very, it's very interesting, but just in case no one knows kind of what that process is like, that, that is what we're dealing with. Um, so back to Hatch's testimony. Um, it was what helped the grand jury successfully indict Richard Crown and shield. Hatch was immensely important, but there were also other witnesses that testified about the night of the murder. George Crown and Shield, the brother of Richard, and two other men referred to as Selman and Chase, testified that they were with Richard at a gambling house in Salem. Weirdly enough, this testimony got all three of these men indicted as well, and all four, <laughs> including Richard, were arrested on May 2nd, just <laughs> shy of a month after the murder. Selman and Chase were not taken to trial, and the charges against them were quickly dismissed. On May 15th, I put Papa Knapp, who's the dad, received a letter in the mail. So that's the dad of the two brothers. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Dear sir, I have taken the pen at this time to address you an utter stranger, and strange as it may seem to you, it is for the purpose of requesting the loan of $350, for which I can give you no security but my word, and in this case, consider this to be sufficient. My call for money at this time is pressing, or I would not trouble you. But with that sum, I have the prospect of turning it to so much advantage as to be able to refund it with interest in the course of six months. At all events, I think it would be for your interest to comply with my requests, and that immediately, that is, not to put off any longer that you receive this, then set down and enclose me the money with as much dispatch as possible for your own interest. This, sir, is my advice. And if you do not comply with it, the short period between now and November will convince you that you have denied such a request, the grant of which will never injure you, the refusal at which will ruin you. Are you surprised at this assertion? Rest assured that I make it reserving to myself the reasons and a series of facts which are founded on such a bottom as will bid defiance to property or quality. It is useful for me to enter into a discussion of facts which must inevitably harrow up your soul. No, I will merely tell you that I am acquainted with your brother, Frank, and also the business that he was transacting for you on the 2nd of April last. And that I think you were very extravagant in giving $1,000 to the person that would execute the business for you. But you know best about that. You see that such thing will leak out. To conclude, sir, I will inform you that there is a gentleman of my acquaintance in Salem that will observe that you do not leave town before the 1st of June. Giving you sufficient time between now and then to comply with my request. And if I do not receive a line from you together with the above sum before the 22nd of this month, I shall wait upon you with an assistant. I have said enough to convince you of my knowledge and merely inform you that you can, when you answer, be as brief as possible. Direct yours, Charles Grant Jr. of Prospect, Maine. 
That sounds like a Mr. James Reynolds letter. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, Mm -hmm. I heard you were giving somebody $1,000 for doing something for you. Mm. And I know about this. And I'm going to up the price. I want $350. Mm. So that'd be great. Thanks. Since you're giving out money for favors, I'm going to do you a favor if you pay me. Well, remember that I said this was sent to Papa Nap, Mm -hmm. not the sons. Mm -hmm. I put, understandably, Papa Nap is like, WTF is this? Mm -hmm. What? (laughs) WTF? I don't know a Charles. Um, And certainly not anyone in this area. So given all the unrest in the community, Papa Knapp went to Wenham to talk to his sons, Joseph and Francis. Francis is who the man in the letter was calling Frank. Uh Uh-huh. Joseph told his father that the letter contained a devilish lot of trash. Ooh, devilish lot. That's interesting. And said that it needed to be given to the vigilance committee. Papa Knapp agreed and gave it to them. Well, this was not the best idea on Joseph's part. And Uh this was just the start of his remarkable ideas to come. Remember how Papa Knapp is Joseph Knapp Sr. And then his son is Joseph Knapp Jr.? Uh Uh-oh. The letter was supposed to go to Junior, not Senior. Joseph Junior took off to Salem to mail two letters the next day. Oh, no. Instead of Joseph mailing them himself, he asked his friend to mail them and said that his father received an anonymous letter that he was going to, quote, nip the silly affair in the bud. Stupid mistake number two. (laughs) The letters were as follows. First up, one addressed to the chairman of the Vigilance Committee, the Honorable Gideon Barstow. It said, Gentlemen of the Committee of Vigilance, hearing that you have taken up four young men on suspicion of being concerned in the murder of Mr. White, I think it is time to inform you that Stephen White came to me one night and told me, if I ever would remove the old gentleman, he would give me $5,000. He said that he was afraid he would alter his will if he lived any longer i told him i would do it but i was afeard to go into the house so he said he would go with me that he would try to get into the house in the evening and open the window and then go home and go to bed and me again at about 11 i found him and we both went to the chamber i struck him in the head with a heavy piece of lead and then stabbed him with a dirk he made the finishing strokes with another He promised to send me the money the next evening and has not yet sent it, which is the reason (laughs) that I mentioned this. Yours, etc. Grant. So he (laughs) confess. Okay. The next letter to the Honorable Stephen White, a nephew of murdered Captain White and the principal heir to Captain White's fortune. It read, Mr. White. We'll send the $5,000 or a part or a part of it before tomorrow night or suffer the painful consequences. Grant. This was about $150,000 today. Nice. <sighs> Guys, this was not smart at all. After receiving the letters, the committee sent a messenger to Maine to wait at the post office for Grant to pick up his mail. Just for good measure, the committee sent Grant $50 in the mail to lure him to the post office. Come to find out, Grant wasn't Grant at all. His name was actually John Palmer, and he was an associate of Richard Crowninshield, and he knew the whole plot. You can probably assume now that Palmer sang like a canary to avoid being prosecuted. The shot could be felt through Salem, and once the letters were compared to Joseph Jr.'s handwriting and proven to be from him, Joseph (sighs) Jr. and Francis were taken into custody. Good times. After just three days in jail, Joseph made a full confession from (laughs) the planning of the murder to lying about the robbers and forging the letters. Shock. Yeah. Richard quickly heard about the confession and... A bit of a trigger warning here. Skip forward if you don't want to hear about um, talks of suicide. Um, and he realized that he was going to be sentenced to death. Richard Crown and Shield completed suicide by hanging himself using a handkerchief tied to the bars of the cell. 
In an odd turn of events, Joseph and Francis couldn't be tried for murder itself. Huh. Why, you may ask? The law at the time stated that accessories to a crime could not be convicted unless the actual murderer was convicted first. Huh. With Richard now gone, the brothers could very well get away with murder. Oh, wow. There was a key aspect to the entire plot that we haven't explored yet. Why? Captain White wrote his niece Mary out of his will as soon as Joseph married into the family. Captain White was weary of Joseph and saw him as a gold digger and too sneaky for his liking. He ain't nothing but a gold digger. Mm Mm-hmm. Even though the Knapp family was respected, something didn't sit right with Captain White. Joseph found out about the change in the will and was furious. Francis was quite irritated as well because he didn't see the point in the change and thought his brother was upstanding. The thought was to steal the new will and kill Captain White so that the estate would go to his niece, Mary, who was the mother-in-law of Joseph. And eventually, it would be Joseph's after she died. Right, right. I wonder if they were going to make that happen sooner rather than later. But neither brother could stomach the thought of murdering Captain White themselves. Enter Richard and George Crowninshield. Joseph promised Richard $1,000 when he obtained the estate if he would murder Captain White. Joseph stole the will a few days before the murder, and Richard followed through with his end of the deal. But when Joseph confessed in jail, it came out that he stole the wrong will. Oh, no. I'm sorry to laugh. What a dummy. Wow. (laughs) Everyone was terrified that the Knapp brothers were going to walk away from the murder charges and never pay for their part in the crime. So Captain White's nephew, Stephen, you know, the one they were extorting for money, and then also told the Committee of Vigilance that Stephen was the one who planned the murder. Sure, sure. You know, him. Stephen and a group of prominent Salem residents raised enough to persuade Senator and lawyer Daniel Webster, not that Webster, (laughs) to come and help the prosecution, even though he was more known for being a defense attorney. Fun fact, Webster had a son named Fletcher. Oh, I know. During the trial, Webster described the murder as, quote, a most extraordinary case in some respects. It is hardly a precedent anywhere. Certainly none in our New England history. This bloody drama exhibited no suddenly excited, ungovernable rage. The actors in it were not surprised by any lion-like temptation springing up their virtue and overcoming it before resistance could begin nor do they do the deed to glut savage vengeance or satiate long-settled and deadly hate. It was a cool, calculating, money-making murder. It was all hire and salary, not revenge. It was the weighing of money against life, the counting out of so many pieces of silver against so many ounces of blood. Interesting. I liked that term when he said it's, it's yeah. counting out silver instead of the ounces of blood. That's pretty sad, though. What a disregard yeah. for life. The brothers were tried separately, and John Francis Knapp was up first. The defense in the first trial stated that Francis couldn't be considered an accessory based on legal requirements. According to the law, an accessory must be present during the murder, and Francis wasn't present at the murder. He was 300 feet away. From the room on the other side of the street, across the street. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Webster stated for the prosecution that, quote, to constitute a presence is sufficient if the accomplice is in a place, either where he may render aid to the perpetrator of the felony or where the perpetrator supposes he may render aid. If they selected the place to afford assistance, whether it was well or ill chosen for that purpose is immaterial. The perpetrator would derive courage and confidence from the knowledge that his associate was in the appointed place. By the law, the defense had a very convincing argument for Francis's innocence. 
The jury deliberated and found John Francis Knapp guilty of murder. Webster's closing arguments were so powerful that they were published in the newspaper after the trials. Wow. Four months after Joseph Knapp Jr. was found, four months after Joseph Knapp Jr. was found guilty of murder as well. Since Joseph made a full confession, the the trial was pretty cut and dry. Both brothers were sentenced to death. John Francis Knapp and Joseph Jenkins Knapp Jr. were hanged together on the same scaffold. The judge for the cases said, quote, if such events had been set forth in a work of fiction, they would have been considered too absurd and unnatural for public endurance. The story would have been treated as a libel upon man who would have imagined that young, well-educated men having respectable connections and means of living could have been found in our cultivated society ready to join such a fearful conspiracy. Who that consider these things will fail to discover an overruling providence which baffles all human device and contra... Contrivances? Contrivances to seal great and deadly crimes. The judge was wrong about the story's suitability for fiction, though. As it turns out, Edgar Allan Poe's Telltale Heart Uh. and Nathaniel Hawthorne's House of Seven Gables Mm. were both inspired by the case. And that is the Salem murder. Very sad. It is. Especially considering, like, the only reason they were murdered... He was murdered was for money. Like, the yeah. only reason. And for you to have to think, because like you said, okay, Captain White's dead. Now it goes to Mary Beckford. Then what's going to happen to Mary? Yeah. Because you already hired someone to kill Captain White. Yeah, you're just going to get tired of her hanging around. Is she going to live too long for And you? she was in her 40s. Yeah. I mean, you're just going to be impatient. I mean... She's not going to let you move in. You're not going to like what she's doing. You're just going to knock her off, too. Mm-hmm. And um, how about this? If you were able to steal the will, what does it matter? But you stole the wrong one, you numpty. But, I mean, if you were able to steal the will, I mean, he was 80-some-odd years old. Do you think he was going to be looking at the will anytime soon? You know, why not just steal the will and just take your chances, dude? I mean, I, I don't know. <sighs> But, I mean, what's funny to me is that Captain White up front was like, something sketchy about him, and I don't like it. So, And he was right. I'm going to write my niece out of the will. He should have just written his great niece out of the will. Yeah, I agree. So... So that is our case for this week. We have a website where you can find any and all ONUC information you are looking for. It is one nation under crime.com. We are one nation under crime on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and at ONUC pod on Twitter. If you love our podcast as much as we do, please follow us and recommend us to your friends, family, coworkers, strangers on the street, doctors. Maybe while not you're in the waiting room. <laughs> Who at knows? The doctor. Anyone. Uh, Please go leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment. If you do that, you could still get a sticker. Yes. We do have a Patreon. If you would like to help with the cost of hosting and making the show, you can find us on Patreon if you search for One Nation Under Crime. Thank you guys for joining us this week. Thank you, and Merry Christmas. We hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas. Yes. Wonderful. And enjoy wrapping your presents. We hope this helped you get through it. Well, and... We have mm. a bonus episode still coming out this week that Just can help in case. You. And our bonus episode this week's pretty fun. So <laughs> And I don't know what it is, so I'm ready. We will get to that in just another couple of days. Yep. We will see you here. Same time. Different crime. Next week. And remember, there isn't always liberty and justice for all. Goodbye. Bye.